So again, if you've just joined us on the platform, Ross Gillespie, the coach of that side, died over the weekend. Ramesh Patel joins us. Mate, thank you so much again for your time. We just wanted to touch base and and talk and celebrate the life of coach. Uh, 60 and 64, he was a black stick himself, a member of the New Zealand Olympic team playing, and then began coaching 72 and 76 course. Led you to the gold medal and a life well worth celebrating. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, he was he was a real legend to us and uh, obviously he created history. Um, and so we have the utmost respect for him, not only as a coach, but as a man as well. He was uh, yeah, a tremendous guy. Look, he was coach at Munich in 72. We didn't make it out of pool play then. Uh, he stayed on as coach. Was that controversial at all at the time or did, or did the players really want him? Um, I, I, I think pretty much uh, the players still wanted him. He was pretty young um, in terms of coaching. I think he started in, uh, uh, just the year before, so the Olympics was probably his first, ex- oh, well, uh, as a player, obviously he went to two Olympics, but as a coach he was uh, pretty young. And uh, so I would imagine that uh, having picked uh, a team that was going to be pretty much around for the next four years, so um, they probably made that decision at that time, which proved to be the correct one. What was, what, you know, just describe a couple of things that you really liked about him and how did he get the best out of you? Yeah, it's uh, interesting because um, when I first got selected and he was the coach who selected me, I suppose, as an 18-year-old. And so um, I was uh, the youngest uh, member in the team and so I always sort of looked up to him as a uh, uh, someone that uh, obviously I had respected, but also I, I feared a lot. Um, you know, he, he sort of gave you that impression of being a grumpy person, um, but he was actually uh, a very nice guy. But uh, it was just uh, at that age that I was at that time. Um, he was uh, he was someone who was very uh, serious when it came to team talks, um, but he had a very dry sense of humour. And uh, and that came through as we got to know him um, more and more. But he certainly wouldn't mince his words when it came to team talks or half-time team talks. Well, you see, these days we'd probably call that bullying, Ramesh, wouldn't we? We'd probably, you know, there'd, there'd probably have to be a review and inquiry into that. I mean, I'm, and I'm being and I'm being half serious when I say that, you know. But um, and, and I'm glad that there weren't cameras if that's the case in the dressing rooms. But he obviously knew how to push your buttons, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. And look, sometimes as players, you know, you don't uh, consider any of that as bullying. You know, it's more just the tone. You know, and sometimes you don't even hear half the words, but it's just the tone that they talk. And you know that uh, if you've played well or not, just by judging by the tone of it. Uh, but he certainly knew how to press the buttons. And bear in mind that, you know, he had quite an experienced team. There was quite a lot of players there that were from the 68s. Um, uh, Olympics um, and obviously 72 before he went to the 76 Olympics um, and he also had uh, players that were under Cyril Walter which was who was the coach of Canterbury um, and so he's competing against him you know I'm sure that uh, people would have wondered why Cyril Walter was not the coach and uh, why Ross Gillespie was the coach so you know, he was probably under a little bit of pressure right through his coaching tenure but uh, he, he performed extremely well you know it's 47 years ago I remember it like it was yesterday I remember waking up on that Sunday morning and I remember it like it was yesterday and we have Brendan Telfer on every Wednesday and one of the most gorgeous things Ravish is listening to his commentary and he just sounds like a little baby boy and that was his first ever <laughs> hockey game that he ever called did you know that yeah no I did I, I, I found that out uh, later on because it, it was, I guess it was unexpected and uh they didn't really have the, the media people all sort of uh, geared up for a possible uh, New Zealand final. So, uh, yeah, someone had to be called in. No, he did a good job. Ross Gillespie, we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, who has passed away in Christchurch, aged 87. And obviously our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone who knew him well and his family and, and everyone that you know he was connected with in hockey. But this is just more about celebrating this life and, and celebrating this man. He was regarded as someone who could, could get the very best out of players, and he really emphasised the importance of the good team environment. When you look back now, and just a little bit more about what you're saying about his team talks and that, did you really appreciate at the time what he was giving and offering you, do you think? Uh, probably not um, early on, you know, um, but uh, we, we started to 
uh, believe that. So from the 72 Olympics, you know, where we didn't do or didn't fare quite so well, um, he was starting to build his own team, you know, with around uh, those experienced um, players and some of the younger players from Auckland because as you're probably aware that Canterbury used to dominate um, the hockey in those scenes uh, in those years and then Auckland started to come up and uh, took over from Canterbury so he was blending a lot of uh, uh, experienced senior Canterbury players with uh, a few of the younger Auckland players and so that took a skill in itself with fierce rivals of course but uh, he blended us into a really good team and while we, you know, hated Canterbury uh, to the core when it yeah, came to yeah. our provincial games, um, you know, when we were in the New Zealand team, boy, did we respect each other, and we still do. Um, and I think that's uh, a little bit of a tribute to uh, Ross as well for bringing us together and uh, just making us uh, a really cohesive and united team. Ramesh Patel is with us on the platform it's such an exclusive club, isn't it? Um, that side and everyone that was connected to it. And by that, I also mean the families and your friends, your loved ones as well. But, you know, it just, it, 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 it still thrills me as a, as, a, as a kid when I was watching it. And I mean, does it do the same to you when it's brought up and do the memories come flooding back? Yeah, look, fortunately, and I guess it's with most of us, uh, our players, you know, we're all, always called upon every Olympic year to you know, either give uh, little sort of talks to um, groups, and these days it tends to be more for uh, even with my grandkids, you know, going to their kindergarten and showing them the gold medal. And uh, yeah, so it certainly gives you goose and bumps. And uh, as I say, every Olympic year it's, um, it just reminds you a little bit more, and it still remains very special to us. With Ross as your coach. What you know was it always a coach-player relationship, or did that change over the years as you all got a little older, got a little bit more mellow and stuff like that? Or did you always consider him whenever you saw him? It was always like he's the coach, he's the boss. Yeah, for me, for me it was always like that. I, I suppose some of the Canterbury players and uh, the more experienced players would have considered him slightly um, differently, but I always saw him as pretty much uh, the boss. Um, but we would have quite a few sort of laughs on tour and uh, he would obviously join in. Normally it was at uh, the expense of our manager, uh, Tony Palmer, who was a great guy. Um, but, you know, we would always sort of have uh, lots of fun and he would just uh, join in and allow us to do that. So you, you always knew... Uh, where your boundaries were, but for me, he was always, um, you know, the person that I'd respected um, as a coach. Um, probably one of the best coaches I've had, and uh, but he was also feared because of that, and um, just because of his. Um, but you also felt comfortable enough to approach him. Uh, but for me, he was more on the on the fear side. I think just uh, just uh, from where I was. You know, throughout that tournament, um, uh, you know, losing to Pakistan 5-2, playing Australia in that final and being such, you know, I mean, we we were just underdogs. There's no question about that. You know, just take us back to that time. What did he do to prepare you for that final, to just give you the belief that you can go out there and win that gold medal? Yeah, so, you know, he was renowned for um, formulating a defensive plan um, at those Olympics. Um, We'd had a reasonable sort of build-up um, but you know we were sort of up and down. We did have an experienced team, but you know he he decided that uh, you know we were going to build this team around defence. Um, myself as a forge, you know we were always involved in um, you know whenever the we lost the ball, we were all sort of form part of that defence. And um, his uh, nickname, of course, is Tack, which stands for tackle. And back in his old in his day, and um, that's pretty much what he was uh, making sure we did. And so he formulated a plan whereby, um, you know, we were going to um, be very strong on defence. No one was going to crack us, and that was obvious even in that first game at the Olympics against uh, um, West Germany, and they were the Olympic champions, and we drew with them. Um, and then again with Spain as well, we drew with them. In a game, and so you know, while we weren't scoring the goals, we were defending and just collecting a point here, a point there. Pakistan, of course, a different story, 
uh, we came back against, uh, I think it was Belgium, um, and uh, you know then got into the semis and then playing the Dutch again it was defence. We went into extra time um, in the semi-final and and came through. So it was always by hard graft. So going into the final, knowing that you've already won a silver medal. You know, he certainly, um, you know, we were sort of semi-celebrating after we'd uh, beaten the Dutch. Uh, but he soon uh, turned us around and said, look, you're never going to get an opportunity like this again. You know, forget about the silver medal. You know, it's another game of hockey we have to play. And uh, and so he got us pretty prepared. But as it turned out in that first half, we were a little bit nervous. Um, and uh, at half time he gave us another rocket and... Uh, and uh, the rest is history, really. I'm just looking at a couple of the fellows. Look at you in your little short shorts and your long flowing mullet. <laughs> <laughs> Handsome <laughs> devil, yeah, you were, you, mate, eh? <laughs> yeah, there's uh, some interesting photos here, especially the shorts. You know, the long hair can come and go, I guess, uh, with time. But, uh, yeah, those shorts is a real giveaway. <laughs> they can't get shorter, Ram- Rami. I mean, they can't, can they? I mean, let's be honest about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want them any shorter hard, than that. It's hard to imagine those trends here. I, I still look at the even the '82 um, World Cup uh, All white side. Team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they was almost similar. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you know, thank you so much for your time and the memories. And just talking to you now, I got to say, look, you know, it's one of the most proud things I've ever seen as a New Zealand sports fan. It still gives me goosebumps, and I remember that Sunday morning well, and I relive it with Telfor all the time as well because he called it. And I know that we've spoken before, and I really appreciate your time. And just wanted to, you know, just collect a couple of thoughts about this man because he was also a bit of a shy guy and that he stayed away from the limelight and he gave that to the players, to all of you guys after you won. Absolutely. You know, he never wanted that limelight. And, um, you know, but that was just the character of the man. But he gave so much to hockey and to New Zealand hockey um, that, uh, you know, it's given so much pleasure, not only to hockey players even now, but uh, to New Zealanders all around, yeah. No, he was a genuinely nice guy. Um, you know, obviously you got to um, see him around a lot, um, just around Masters hockey and things like that. And, but he carried on coaching and helping teams you know, right through. Uh, but, yeah, he's one of those sort of genuine nice guys of, uh, of New Zealand, really, and not only of hockey. Well, we've lost another one, haven't we, mate? And, um, you know, I, you know, obviously uh, <clears throat> all our thoughts and prayers to the friends and the family and all of you that were so tightly connected. And um, But I just wanted to touch base today and, you know, again, say, wow, what an amazing achievement. And also just to, um, just to reflect on a couple of stories about this great man. Thank you so much. You're welcome.